deadly wind and water slam into America's Gulf Coast. Katrina changed weather history because Katrina was weather history. Two states, Louisiana and Mississippi, suffer the harshest aftermath. It was unbelievable. The Mississippi Gulf Coast got hit by an atomic bomb. A lot of national media people were saying that we had dodged a bullet. We were saying, oh no, it's much worse. A catastrophic natural disaster is made all the more horrendous by a bungled response. Every possible thing that could go wrong went wrong. It was a man-made disaster. They know it. Everybody knows it. The response of government at every level was faulty, to put it nicely. It leaves a nation outraged and sends ripples through the economy. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, Hurricane Katrina, the costliest and one of the deadliest hurricanes ever to hit the U.S. Despite the meteorological technology that predicts its arrival, Katrina's fury proves how vulnerable we really are. August 2008, New Orleans. Almost three years to the day after Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Gustav is projected to be on a collision course with the Gulf Coast. The Big Easy looks like the bullseye again. There's a potential for a big one. We reached a very powerful uh, Category 3 hurricane. We never thought it was going to be a Katrina. But the unpredictable part of it, just like in Katrina, is will the levees hold? The deja vu of disaster sparks anxiety levels close to panic. But this time, things are different. This time, the call for evacuation begins earlier. Most of the people got out with Gustav. People were shell-shocked from Katrina. They weren't about to stay behind this time. As they leave, many wonder, what will their city be like when they return? America's Gulf Coast, dubbed the Energy Coast for its oil and natural gas, is rich with economic and recreational resources. The Gulf Coast states share similarities, but also have great differences. Louisiana and Mississippi share a unique culture. There are so many musical families in New Orleans that go back three, sometimes four generations. We have a lot of rivalries down south. You have Mississippi, you have Louisiana. You know, we used to always run jokes about Mississippi being poorer than us, and then they get mad. And of course, their gumbo is better than the original. This goes on. It, it's, it's a great place to be from. Property damage, including crop losses, is high. Louisiana and Mississippi also share a history of hurricanes. In Biloxi, Mississippi, meteorologist and former Navy hurricane hunter Mike Reeder knows the deadly risks and surprising benefits hurricanes bring. They take the heat that builds up at the surface of the Earth and they move it into the upper atmosphere. They're natural phenomena that, in the dynamics of this Earth, are necessary. When hurricanes threaten Mississippi, the state's geography leaves it especially vulnerable. We don't live on deep water. You walk a mile out into the Mississippi Sound and you're up to your knees. So this huge storm surge can come in on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and literally just wipe us right off the map. Next door to Mississippi, Louisiana is vulnerable for a different reason. Its natural defenses, the wetlands and barrier islands, have been largely wiped out over the past century thanks to industry and urban expansion. What's the difference between a natural phenomenon and a disaster? And the very simple answer is people. So from an environmental perspective, losing all these miles year after year is hugely devastating. 
It's also very, very dangerous for lives and property. Most of New Orleans is below sea level, protected by a massive levee system. But over the years, some levees have fallen into disrepair and are slowly sinking. Past hurricanes have proven that weather poses serious threats to both states. In 2004, a badly executed hurricane evacuation in New Orleans exposes flaws in the city's disaster plan. That same year, scientists stage a hurricane exercise, animated as a war game, showing how a Category 3 hurricane could be catastrophic. But little changes. There was an awareness of exactly how bad it was going to be. But there was a disconnect between an academic awareness and an acceptance of the reality of what was going to happen and the implications of what was going to happen. Tuesday, August 23rd, 2005. The National Hurricane Center in Miami takes official notice of a tropical depression about 175 miles southeast of Nassau, Bahamas. Prediction models forecast this disturbance will drive west across southern Florida and into the eastern Gulf of Mexico. It is hurricane season, so many Louisiana and Mississippi residents are aware of the disturbance east of Florida. Most are not worried yet. Wednesday, August 24th. The circulation now has sustained surface winds of 40 miles an hour, earning it official tropical storm status and a name, Katrina. Thursday, August 25th, at 6.30 p.m., Katrina makes landfall near North Miami Beach. Just before doing so, it strengthens into a hurricane with 80 mile an hour winds. Katrina is moving only six miles per hour, much slower than the speed of a typical hurricane. Although only a category one, 14 people die in Florida as a result of Katrina. Some people seem to be caught off guard by the strength of the wind. Instead of dissipating after moving inland, Katrina moves west-southwest back into the Gulf of Mexico and re-energizes its strength fed by warm waters and favorable atmospheric conditions. Friday, August 26th, Katrina's 80 mile an hour winds are expected to escalate into category three strength. In Mississippi, hurricane reports catch the public's attention. All those other ones missed us to the east. This one doesn't look like that's going to happen. This is going to probably be one of the close to the worst case scenarios. In Louisiana, activities continue as planned as high schools gear up for fall. We were going to have our football jamboree, and I got a call from parish government. The message basically was, well, we need to be wary of this system, but we'll wait and see. Out in the Gulf, Katrina intensifies by the hour. State officials go on high alert. Mississippi Governor Haley Barber and Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco declare states of emergency. In Mississippi, the call to get out is urgent. News outlets and government officials encourage the public to start evacuating now. We're telling people this is a bad storm. You need to leave. You need to evacuate. This is not a storm to play around with. Southeast of New Orleans, Local leaders know that traffic snarls will make escape impossible if they wait too long. They issue mandatory evacuation orders for their counties, called parishes. But beyond those counties, state officials are just starting to warn people to leave. Some local officials, including New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin, aren't sure when to initiate an evacuation. And some people are tuned into a different message that Friday night. The problem with Katrina was timing. Most people are at the Saints game or watching it on TV. So they didn't catch the news. They went to bed, they went about their lives, and somewhere around 3 o'clock, 3.30, they started getting wind that there was something going on in the Gulf. Saturday, August 27th, Katrina is now a dangerous Category 3 hurricane.
predicted to become an apocalyptic Category 5. The monster is calculated to make a direct hit on the Gulf Coast within two days. New Orleans could soon be in the crosshairs. Saturday, August 27, 2005. The Gulf Coast shorelines of Mississippi and Louisiana are calm. But the full force of Hurricane Katrina is expected to slam into both states within two days. In Mississippi, evacuation has been moving swiftly since Friday. But only now are state and local officials in Louisiana finally warning the public. I had a press conference on Saturday urging people to get out. Take this very seriously. This is not a test. This is the real deal. Saturday afternoon, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco asks President Bush to declare a federal state of emergency. Vacationing at his ranch in Crawford, Texas, he approves the request, which allows federal agencies to help. A representative from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Marty Baja Monday, arrives in New Orleans to assess damage and relay response needs. That same afternoon, governors in Louisiana and Mississippi open all highway lanes for travel, one way out of the cities. In Mississippi, most people appear to have heeded the warnings. Traffic moves quickly. But it's a different story in Louisiana. Evacuation from New Orleans is slow. More than 20% of that state's population lives in and around the city. Kathleen Blanco explains that evacuating an urban area is a major task. It was pretty intense. It's, it's not an easy thing to evacuate an enormous population center. Hurricane hunters have been in the sky taking readings of Katrina. They report it is gaining strength. By late Saturday, coastal county officials in Mississippi start ordering mandatory evacuations. Sunday, August 28th. Just after midnight, the National Hurricane Center upgrades Katrina to a Category 4. Six hours later, 160 mile an hour winds upgrade Katrina to a 5. It is a terrifying hurricane. Estimated time to landfall, 20 hours. 9 a.m., roughly 12 hours after Mississippi County leaders issued mandatory evacuation orders, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco joins New Orleans first term Mayor Ray Nagin to finally announce a mandatory evacuation. I do not want to create panic, now, there's a rush to get out. There are long lines for gas and food at favorite local eateries, like the Camellia Grill. The cars would pack up by the shell, block long, getting gas, and everybody's, give me like five burgers to go. We about to hit the road. We were like the last salvations. We were like, we, we can survive if we get some burgers and omelets, and we're taking it on the road. <laughs> But for many, it's too late. Some people just turned around and came back because they felt like the just timing wasn't there for it. We evacuated over 1.3 million people in 36 hours. What we did not know is how many people remained in the area. In Louisiana and Mississippi, many poor residents don't have the resources to get out of town. Evacuation requires a vehicle that can make the evacuation, a credit card, and about a $1,000 investment or more, depending on the size of your family. City contracted buses sporadically arrive at 12 pickup points throughout New Orleans and transport stranded people to the Superdome, a much publicized shelter of last resort. Communities surrounding New Orleans prepare their own shelters. Chalmette High School doubles as a shelter for St. Bernard Parish. Sunday evening, about 250 people came to this shelter, and we got many of the elderly and the sick people. 
Most of the million plus people in the greater New Orleans area do get out. But roughly 100,000 people stay behind, such as those too poor, sick, or too elderly to leave, including people in nursing homes and hospitals. But a lot of people also didn't want to leave because there's a sense that you are leaving everything behind and you don't know what is going to happen when you return. And that was a legitimate fear. In Mississippi, however, there is a mass exodus inland. Most people have cars and by nightfall, much of the coastal area is deserted. Residents have headed to the safety of shelters away from the shoreline. Monday, August 29th, 2 a.m. Katrina begins to lose strength, but is still expected to be a large and intense hurricane at landfall. Four hours later, at 6 a.m., the assault begins. Packing 125 mile per hour sustained winds, it slams on shore near Burris, Louisiana, about 80 miles south of New Orleans. Advanced technology allows experts to predict the path of the hurricane, but meteorological mastery can't protect Louisiana and Mississippi from Katrina's ferocity. In New Orleans, the winds drive a surge of water 14 to 17 feet high into overwhelmed channels and canals. Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Bourne spill over their banks. The winds were coming out of the north. That started pushing the water in from the lake toward the levee system. And then any weakness in the levee system got exploited. New Orleans' main issue was the water. 6.30 a.m., man-made channels funnel a surge of water caused by Katrina's powerful wind into the battered levees. The industrial canal levee suffers small pressure breaks. Water overtops levee walls in some places. In others, the levees slide or buckle. 7 a.m., Hurricane Katrina has been battering southeast Louisiana since before dawn. Sustained winds are 70 to 80 miles per hour in the New Orleans area, with gusts to 120 miles per hour on the east side. Cell phone towers go down. Satellite phone batteries are dying. Landlines are failing. So is electricity. An apocalypse unleashes on the Gulf Coast. We went from a modern, internet-driven society to third world country in the space of nine hours. Monday, August 29th, 2005. Hurricane Katrina is decimating parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. But the two states experience the catastrophe very differently. In Louisiana, Shelmet High School in St. Bernard Parish doubles as a shelter of last resort. The people who have sought refuge here are weathering Hurricane Katrina in grim circumstances. The wind was raging. We didn't have electricity. The windows burst, but we were doing fine, we thought. Inside the Superdome, evacuees can hear the ferocious winds and rain tear at the building. The storm rips away large sections of the roof. As the early morning passes, wind-driven surge overtops New Orleans levees in some places and breaches others. 9 a.m., the eye of Hurricane Katrina passes over the Mississippi coast, moving at about 15 miles per hour. Though Katrina hits with Category 3 winds, its surge are unprecedented. With hurricane force winds up to 170 miles wide, Katrina is one of the most immense hurricanes ever recorded in the Atlantic Basin. In Mississippi, surge heights are 10 feet higher than in Louisiana. Up to 32 feet of water push onto the Mississippi coastline, 
inundating 80 miles of coast. Along with the storm surge, Katrina spawns tornadoes, which spread damage as far north as Tupelo, Mississippi. In New Orleans, the 17th Street, London Avenue, and industrial canals all suffer breaches. But the French Quarter, on high ground, remains dry. Early national news reports proclaim New Orleans levees have held. But local newspaper reporter John Pope finds out those early reports are dead wrong. He's been holed up at the New Orleans Times-Picayune headquarters. Some of my colleagues had ridden out to the east in delivery trucks, and they had seen people standing on their roofs. Our art critic and our features editor had biked out to Lake Pontchartrain, where they saw the levee breach. When a lot of national media people were saying that we had dodged a bullet, we were saying, oh no, it's much worse. Greater New Orleans and the rest of the world are about to find out just how much worse. Monday, August 29th, 2005. By the afternoon, Hurricane Katrina's winds have decreased. The hurricane has moved inland and begins to dissipate. In Mississippi, which felt the full force of the winds earlier, the worst is over. But in Louisiana, the disaster is still unfolding. In St. Bernard Parish, 250 people are riding out Katrina at Shelmet High School when massive flooding begins. And we looked up and saw that wall of water and immediately began trying to get all of those people upstairs because we had them all on the first floor. And when these floodwaters rushed in, they were pushing our cars around like they were toys. We got everyone upstairs, but we lost most of our provisions. 5 p.m. FEMA representative Marty Bahamunde is on a Coast Guard helicopter surveying damage in New Orleans. He takes pictures and at 7 p.m. calls FEMA director Michael Brown to report the disaster. Reporting all the way up the chain of command is not easy. FEMA director Brown calls Deputy White House Chief of Staff Joe Hagan. But neither the President nor the Department of Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff act on those reports until the next morning. Bureaucratic changes after 9-11 have complicated the process. FEMA is now part of Homeland Security. Before FEMA got thrown into Homeland Security, it had been in the White House, and that is clout. That means that somebody, usually the person who had that job, was a friend of the president. And that person could walk down the hall and say, we've got a problem here. Finally, Tuesday evening, August 30th, nearly 24 hours after Marty Bahamunde reported massive levee breaches, Chertoff formally invokes the National Response Plan, making the disaster a federal priority. Mississippi's road to recovery is another story. We seem to be well coordinated down here. After some initial glitches, we seem to really be able to focus on the issue. And I do think Mississippi came out ahead. The recovery effort has moved into high gear. Disaster relief workers cut through downed inland trees and begin to clear wreckage in coastal towns ravaged by Katrina. But media attention is focused on Louisiana as TV networks begin to broadcast pictures of a still worsening crisis. Failed levees have left 80% of the New Orleans area underwater. In the city alone, nearly 200,000 homes are submerged. Thousands of people are stranded in attics or clinging to rooftops. Some try to navigate through the water Others wait at the Superdome for help. Camellia Grill server Marvin Word Day safely got out of the city to Fort Worth, Texas. Now, 
He and fellow evacuees are heartsick over what they see on TV. No matter where you was, you felt it, you know, and just, he wanted to come back home and everybody was in the hotels crying. It was sad, it was a very sad moment. The floodwaters keep coming. At Shelnut High School, water rises to the second floor. The flood waters leveled to about eight feet, which was well over my head, just under the overhang. People were trapped on their rooftops, and the boats came bringing them to us, and we pulled them in through the second floor windows of the school. In 90 degree plus heat, the number of those seeking shelter at Shalmet skyrockets from 250 to more than 1,200 people. They have no power dwindling water supplies, and almost no food. Only four hospitals in New Orleans remain open. One of them is Oxner Hospital in Jefferson Parish. The flooding, even though we're six miles from the epicenter, came up to our front door. We had a hospital full of inpatients, and no water, no electricity, no sewer, very little food. In Biloxi, Mississippi, surge waters have heaved floating casino barges onto coastline homes. Miles of oceanfront towns have been wiped clean. Highway 90 along the coast is decimated. The one bright spot is that surge waters have receded and recovery can start. Power tools and gas-powered generators rev into high gear. I think there was more of a pick up your bootstraps and get to work attitude in Mississippi. And I saw people outside with chainsaws. People were outside with rakes and chainsaws trying to do what little they could. While residents get to work, local, state, and federal agencies in both states struggle to mobilize. Most communications are either down or operating on incompatible band frequencies. In Louisiana, conditions at the Superdome are deteriorating. We are human beings and they're treating us like we're criminals. Even the famous Mike Brown, was the head of FEMA at the time, really expected buses to be delivered to the Superdome and to the convention center for the evacuation very quickly, and those buses didn't come. Had buses arrived as first promised, thousands could have escaped. By Tuesday, Rising floodwaters have all but sealed off the city. Wednesday, August 31st, two days after Katrina made landfall, President Bush cuts his holiday short and flies over Louisiana. He surveys the flooding from aboard Air Force One. For those on the ground, it's beginning to feel like a war zone. I've often thought this is what it must be like to cover a war, except that People who cover wars get nice homes to go to return to. Our war came to us. There were really three separate disasters. One was the hurricanes, the natural disaster. The second was the failure of the levees to do what they were supposed to. And then the third was the, the bungled response. Hey, yeah. But there are plenty of heroes. The Coast Guard, Fish and Wildlife Services, and a band of volunteers called the Cajun Navy have been performing rescue missions from the air and water. Their efforts will save thousands of people. By Wednesday afternoon, there is still no relief at the Superdome. 20,000 people wait for help in squalor. Others are stranded at the New Orleans Convention Center. We have over 3,000 people out of here with no home, no shelter. What are they going to do? What are we going to do? And still more are on the Interstate 10 overpass. Grisly scenes repeat across the once beautiful city. Corpses float by or lay in the streets. The emergency response in New Orleans is an utter failure. When you saw what was going on, you not only wanted to scream, you wanted to get in a car, drive down there, and pull people out yourself. 
The fact that people sat on overpasses in 100 degree heat and were unable to be rescued in the United States of America just was shocking beyond belief. While well, most of the American people were watching images of people in downtown New Orleans who were in the Superdome or the convention center, we were sitting here at the school and no one came for us. I thought we were living the life of Job. You know, it was, it was a flood, fire, brimstone, you know, you name it, it was happening. And we had to rebuild it. September 2005, two states have suffered horrific but different consequences from Hurricane Katrina. Mississippi's coastline has been largely swept away by surge waters. The hurricane claims more than 200 lives. In Louisiana, flooding drowns one of America's prized cities. The death toll in Louisiana will eventually rise to more than 1,500. Damage estimates put the price tag at $81 billion. It will become the costliest natural disaster in American history. Economic losses from crippled oil, shrimping, and tourist-driven industries increase the total by millions each day. Katrina's economic, psychological, and political ripple effects are being felt around the country. Slow rescue and recovery efforts spark outrage. Where's the help? I know it's out there. I know there's volunteers that are probably begging to get here just to help. What's the problem? Friday, September 2nd, on the ground in Alabama, President Bush appears unaware of any slow government response. Instead, he commends FEMA and its director, Michael Brown, for their efforts. Brown, you're doing a heck of a job. The FEMA director's working 24 hours. I think he thought that his people were on top of it and realized too late that was not the case. Sunday, September 4th. Six days after Katrina, the last evacuees are finally pulled from the New Orleans Superdome. Daily life is a struggle. The shock that you go through when you live through something like this is something that you just can't even describe. It's everything that all of us take for granted as a basic functioning in life is just gone. In Mississippi, however, the recovery is moving along quickly, and the state's political machine moves into high gear. Governor Haley Barber, former chairman of the Republican National Committee, has powerful political allies in his state, and even closer ties to President Bush. Political clout makes a tremendous difference uh, in times of trouble. And clearly, after Katrina, Haley Barber had more political clout here in Washington than Kathleen Blanco did. God bless. Within six months, Barber and company get more than $5 billion allocated to rebuild Mississippi on the fast track. They did two or three things that really, I think, impressed even skeptics. They literally had architectural plans about how they wanted to rebuild. Secondly, they had priorities. The third thing they did, well, they came up and they said, and we want to help ourselves. First term Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco, a Democrat, can't match Barber's insider experience or connections. You were talking about a much newer, less experienced group of people, not just with the administration, but in the city. Her state's initial $200 billion recovery proposal is less organized and stalls in Congress. Blanco says politics got in the way of recovery. This particular hurricane got politicized, and this recovery effort should have never been politicized. Too many people's lives are at stake. All natural disasters get politicized unless they're handled perfectly. Late September, only three weeks after Katrina, funding pours into Mississippi. Though most coastal communities are still devastated, a few businesses are already reopening. In St. Bernard Parish, Louisiana, it's a struggle to get even a single school open. 
FEMA informed Superintendent Doris Vaudier that out of the 18 schools in her district, it might be possible to get one open by March 2006. That's when I said, basically, to hack with you. We're going to do it ourselves, and we're going to send you the bill. We located classroom trailers in Georgia and in Carolina. We had them shipped down. Without a dime of the government's initial emergency funds, the school opens nearly four months before FEMA's most optimistic projections. Both Mississippi and Louisiana are showered with love and help. And we have our ups and downs, yeah, you know, as a country, we're kind of short-sighted and greedy. But in a moment of crisis, Americans got together and handled their business. The Big Easy benefits from many celebrities and famous natives. They lend a hand with ambitious initiatives to bring their neighbors home. New Orleans musicians, the very beat of America's soul kitchen, are high on that list. Among them is Grammy Award winner Branford Marsalis, who launches the Musician's Village Project with longtime friend and fellow New Orleans native Harry Connick Jr. It was just the helplessness that drove me crazy, the inability to do something. Who do you blame? It's like, is that going to save somebody's life? It's over, all right? It happened. What are we doing next? Musician's Village, this is going to be it. I think volunteer work is the main backbone of, of the Musician's Village. The Musician's Village organization partners with Habitat for Humanity and gets substantial funding. We got enough money to build 80 homes. And when they saw what we did, the Baptist Crossroads Foundation gave us enough money to build 300 homes. Between 2005 and 2007, charitable giving to this area topped $6 billion. But as the outpouring of help continues, the finger pointing begins. There are demands to find out who is at fault. Within a month of Katrina's landfall, congressional and Senate investigations get underway. In February, courts are scathing. They demand reforms at every level. By 2007, New Orleans' iconic trolleys are rolling through parts of the city as Camellia Grill reopens for business. But for large parts of the city, recovery is still a long way away. People in the Big Easy watch the... In all, five states were affected by Hurricane Katrina. But Louisiana and Mississippi bore the brunt of the devastation. Each state responded to the disaster differently, exposing severe deficiencies in disaster preparedness and response. Now at federal, state, and local levels, government officials promise that those mistakes won't ever be made again. In Katrina's wake, Governor Kathleen Blanco resumes a decades-long plea in Louisiana for the restoration of the state's wetlands. Blanco doesn't run for re-election. In 2008, former congressman and newly elected governor Bobby Jindal continues to press for wetland restoration funding. Today in Louisiana, the new watchword is preparedness. Don't wait until the storm happens. Don't wait till the wildfires are at the doorstep. Don't wait till the flood's there. Don't wait till the levees break, the hurricane comes. Don't wait till, God forbid, the terrorist attack comes. Now's the time to be prepared. In Louisiana, the Army Corps of Engineers is working on an ambitious systemic overhaul called the 100-Year Plan of Protection. It is designed to greatly improve hurricane surge and flood protection for New Orleans and the surrounding communities by 2011. By 2008, New Orleans had fixed pumps, added some floodgates, and bolstered some levees. New evacuation plans were in place and were soon put to the test. On August 30th, Hurricane Gustav barrels toward New Orleans. The city and surrounding parishes successfully evacuate 95% of the population. 
In the case of Gustav, even though this wasn't a small hurricane, it was not near as large as Katrina, and it moved farther away from both areas. Gustav made a comparatively mild landfall as a Category 2. The levees held, and New Orleans was largely spared. While Louisiana cleaned up from widespread wind damage, New Orleans and the country breathed the collective sigh of relief. This time, some say complacency is dangerous. You can hide from the wind, but you cannot hide from the water. If we had a big hurricane come over there again, we're going to have a massive flood in New Orleans. Louisiana's wetlands are also vulnerable. Erosion, accelerated sinking, and hurricanes have left oil transfer pipelines exposed near the Gulf of Mexico. They sit as prime targets for future attacks from nature or man. Historian Ron Chapman worries about the impact on national security and America's economic future. Most of the offshore drilling in the United States is done off the coast of Louisiana. The source of energy for the entire country is potentially compromised. And again, nobody's paying attention to it the way they should. I think across the country, people look back at Katrina and say, that's what caused the country to start examining not only its preparation, but its infrastructure to make sure that never again will that happen. But we've got a choice. That's not inevitable. <laughs>